The word trope carries with it negative connotations. Some consider it tired because the baseline identifier provocates something we've seen before. But I disagree with this notion. I believe, rather than simply pointing at something typical, we should instead acknowledge how these stories transform a trope to synthesize with their own unique narratives. When I see a rescue arc, I don't think, not again. I think, let's go! Because One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach, stories once considered the big three in the West, all do something similar. They not only use the same trope, but dedicate multiple arcs to it. But why? Why the paralleled fixation on rescuing someone? Is it perhaps some Otomotobo conspiracy? Perhaps the most elaborate underground meme between these three? A secret retaliation against those who criticize these stories for a reusing of the same arc formula? Well, spoiler alert, I'll be debunking my own mock theory in this video. Because when examining what each series does with the rescue arc, we can find very different executions. And, second spoiler alert, all of them are beyond exceptional. I'll be splitting this video into three marked sections that you can jump around as you please. For example, if you've seen Naruto and Bleach but haven't One Piece, just skip ahead. As an important side note though, this will be the first part of a longer series. This project ended up being a lot denser than I initially thought, so for my sanity, I'm going to have to split it up. If you want more of this, please like and share this video. It really does motivate me to make more. Now, without further ado, let's get to rescuing the perception of a tired trope. From the very conception of his journey, Luffy was driven by something far greater than personal gain. One Piece, that great treasure lying at the climax of his path, it alone would never suffice. The unheard words he utters to his brothers, and the lamentation he exudes to one when the other was gone. Both of these scenes take place on that same ridge. Both are surely similar in that they speak of the immaterial. Did Luffy simply say he wanted to become King of the Pirates? I've put my money on no. Because while the goal is the One Piece, the material possession that will grant rights to the King of the Pirates, it would mean little if it led to merely dominance. This story has never been about the One Piece, but the avenue that the treasure opens. Whoever holds the key will surely acquire the power to usurp the throne and control and morph the world stage in whatever way they see fit. The world government fears this phenomenon more than anything else. Their perfect world destroyed and replaced by someone else's canvas. But ironically, their demise won't be at the hands of a superior dominator, but by the inspiration exuding from a man who refuses to even sit at the top. The origin of this eventual great usurper was in a land plagued by the current system's wretchedness. Neither Ace nor Luffy could stop the world from taking away their other brother. Sabo, in all his powerlessness, made a concession. Since he couldn't be saved, he decided to save himself. An imperfect start, and an abrupt end to his pirate adventure. Both scenarios the result of circumstances brought upon by this world's ruler. A common phenomenon that was cemented in the mind of our kid protagonist. If one wants to liberate the ones they love, if one wants to be free, truly free, then they must acquire the strength to break the subjugating chains from heaven. A half-dead man at the mercy of a farcical execution. A benevolent liar outpaced by a malevolent deceiver. A trapped cook locked in a cage he put himself in and an outwardly whimsical girl with inward distress. Luffy begins his journey, saving them all with one sole method. No pondering, no adaptation, no compromise. The climax of his dawn brings him to his most complex problem yet, a village plagued by dominance and corruption. When one of the villagers decides to take matters into her own hands, she is crushed by the weight of the world. But Luffy lightens her load, not with his words, not with the comforting embrace, but with his actions. He doesn't care to hear her story, doesn't care about this place's history, he only wants to lift a fallen friend. But in acting for such a simple reason, in resolving the conflict with a sheer disregard for the complexities layering it, Luffy frees his friend. Nami couldn't quell even a fraction of this world's darkness alone, and Luffy can't even leave the East Blue without his navigator. But at the end of this conflict, our hero's brash decisions allow Nami the freedom to dictate Luffy's fate. But there's another factor in all of this. It's the reason Nami ultimately chooses to help Luffy and leave her recovering home. It's not just what Luffy did, it's also the thought behind those blows. A thought constantly sparking something in the minds of his observers. A great swell behind a goofy demeanor. A constitution that no one will ever silence his freedom, nor the freedom of those around him. If he can't stop the subjugation alone, his insane adherence to his pirate way will inspire the surrounding masses into picking up the slack. Because after all, deep down, everyone wants to be free. 
This phenomenon happened on this tiny island, and it would happen time and time again after this on a progressively larger scale. Nami is rescued not only thanks to Luffy's actions, but his dedication to his simple way of life. This methodology would be challenged, though. With their ship on the brink, Usopp's departure, and Robin's betrayal, the Straw Hats don't know what to do. The world government's grasp only amounts to one-third of their recent struggles, but it is the straw that broke the camel's back for this not-so-motley crew. Their passion is siphoned, and with it, their trust in Robin wanes. Three members down, and no sign of the coming storm letting up. Luffy takes it the hardest. For a man so notoriously gleeful that his bright smile is even documented in his wanted poster, to go for so long without our hero even cracking a smirk is almost eerie. Moving forth without the Mary, the battle with Usopp, and the decision to make Robin either a friend or foe. It's all Luffy's call as captain. At no time before this was his status ever tested as much as it is now. No matter what happens, no matter the weight he carries, if he succumbs even for a moment, the unit he's amassed will fall apart. They rely on him to be the beacon of hope in all this mess, but at the same time, Luffy is relying on Robin. Everyone has their limits. If Robin were to confess that everything was a lie on her end, how would Luffy react? It's safe to assume he wouldn't be able to take it at this point. Luffy places his last remaining leg firmly on the ground and sprints for the truth, but the truth has horrors irrelevant from the Straw Hat's turmoil. And when Robin flees again without a definitive response, Luffy is defeated. The storm nears its climax. Luffy is going to drown. But just before all light seems snuffed out, he hears a message from the last comrade he rescued in a dire situation. Where Luffy once gave Nami hope with a simple remark, Nami returns the favor with an elaborative wail. If Robin was never a traitor, then the rest doesn't matter. World government? Poneglyphs? Void century? Who cares? All that matters is he can finally act. Right in sync with the greatest swell of Aqua Lagana, Luffy raises a storm of his own, one directed toward Innie's lobby. When the complexities plaguing them are swept away by the captain's resolve, the crew synchronizes with his mentality. It's not just Luffy standing in defiance against the world, wanting to get stronger so as to match this overwhelming force, but his friends as well. A few diverse bodies, but sharing one mind. Standing opposite of them are a unified group in uniform only, their leader wavering constantly, and the most competent among them unable to trust him. The Straw Hats, once hopelessly outmatched when faced with a sliver of this world's secret darkness, transcend themselves to surpass CP9's power. These power-ups not granted to them through extended training, but a newfound clarity of mind. Water 7 was the first time the Straw Hats had suffered so many consecutive defeats, and this was because their minds were muddled with a gaping rift in their crew. Now, they have persevered past that with their resolve screaming out in unison. Will is even more important than prowess in battle. This reinforced will manifests as upgrades for our main characters, and trailing behind them is an unlikely alliance. People that were all once foes a day before this are working together to help rescue Robin. Not because it's equally beneficial for most of them, but because they are all equally inspired. Not just by Luffy's light anymore, but by the projected light of the entire crew. If freedom is being robbed in front of them, then they will break the subjugating chains from heaven together. This notion only being strengthened by the final act of the arc, it isn't Luffy's words that come before the final blows, but Usopp's. A man whose mind was the most muddled out of them all during their greatest turmoil, but here, growing past and moving past it all with the helpful guidance of another light's words, rekindles Luffy's light, giving him one last spark to ignite the embers of victory. And even before this, it was the very woman they had come to rescue that shouted the most important words that fueled their transcendence. The beauty of Innie's lobby is not only the successful rescue of Robin, but how despite their vastly different ambitions, they all together completely converge on Luffy's path of freedom. Naruto did not rise above anything alone. He was also never allowed the privilege of having his hypocrisy go unchecked. The same power that granted him passage into Neji's conscience is the very same power that would later become the limitations altering another rescue attempt. The origin of this power says it all. His parents, as gifted as they were whether genetically or cognitively, could not triumph against the world's secret growing darkness. Since they were outmaneuvered, the next best thing in their arsenal was to entrust. They rescued their son, placed immense power in him, and left him to deal with the troubles ahead. Minato could not see his former student behind a mask. One can never save what they can't even see. But he did save the one who would later rip that mask off this darkness, 
revealing something far more gray than black. To get to this point though, Naruto had to suffer through his parents' first and last parting gift. They preserved light in this world, but in the process, they also added more darkness to an already heavy abyss. To surpass these brave souls, Naruto would have to preserve the positive without adding to the negative. Luckily for him, his path would eventually allow him to do even more than that. He would help the negative transform into a positive. Naruto, grown confident in his recent ideological victories, storms ahead not knowing his next task would allow him to do more of the same. Tsunade's reveal is one of my favorites, because it's a stark contrast to the complexities laying her character in despair. She's initially portrayed as a brash, arrogant, and mischievous woman, so it makes sense to draw particular conclusions regarding her absence from the leaf. It's surely her selfish, indomitable, free spirit that compels her to abandon duty. But, as we know, this isn't even close to the truth, not in the slightest. Tsunade is afraid. Afraid of loss. Paradoxical to her lifestyle, which features her infinite gambling losses, but it's a striking, almost humorous contrast to her true nature. This paradox actually fits her character quite well, because her outward persona is nothing but a mask. And I'm not talking about the one that hides her wrinkles, but the mask she keeps tightly on her face to keep from getting hurt again. The one placed on her after her beliefs were crushed one after another. Those beliefs were tightly bound to her homeland. It makes sense that she would leave after her trust was betrayed more than once. She lost two loved ones after entrusting them with her blessing. So she curses her own words, and curses the land that they were inspired from. But she isn't bitter toward any of it, not even at herself. After the years pass, she's only left with somber air, a longing for mistakes that have already been cemented to be undone, a perpetual state of sadness freezing her in a stasis. When the serpent offers the forbidden fruit that holds promises of a melting embrace, it takes everything in her not to crack. But even after exuding a semblance of belief still left within, she cannot quell the past's lingering damage. She cannot save herself from despair. But Naruto, on an unconscious path inspired by the one who saved him, allowed to exist because of his parents' will to save their son, is motivated to save Tsunade. Not to save her from the enemy, but to save her from herself. Tsunade once mocked the title of Hokage, a title that her loved ones both aspired towards, a title that Naruto believes holds great validity in pursuing. He would prove something here with his newfound strength, not to win a bet, but to demonstrate why the pursuit of Hokage matters. If people of the past failed, he would succeed. Not because he's gifted, but because he won't stop. He won't stop training, won't stop lecturing, and won't stop not giving up on an old bag ready to throw in the towel. He can't give up. It's his ninja way, after all. In fighting against impossible odds within a conflict he had no business being in, in giving Tsunade the push she needed to save him after the fact, in fulfilling his end of the bargain because of it all, Naruto rescues Tsunade. She doesn't fear blood anymore, because she is no longer haunted by the past. She can once again look toward the future, not simply entrusting Hokage, but grabbing the title firmly in her hand. This growth she experienced with the help of a tiny knucklehead. The Rasengan, a technique Naruto acquired as a reward for his past success, its second use is much less respectable. Jiraiya, however, does not scold Naruto. The world of adults is complicated. Indoctrination can never completely quell the hurricane that is ambition. Orochimaru succumbed to his, and Jiraiya could not stop him. He views his past comrade as permanently gone, but the layers of skin surrounding this monster only hide what's underneath. Orochimaru does eventually change for the better. But long before that could happen, he would have to entice the unlikely man who would later change him. The man that is only comparable to him in his thirst for power. Sasuke didn't hurt the leaf. He quietly abandoned it. An unheard whimper in the night, and words displaying humanity still intact. From his perspective, Sasuke was liberating himself. The leaf, while a warm and welcoming home, contrasted far too much from the realities just outside its border. It made him weak against what once hurt him. He couldn't contest with darkness because the embrace of light smothered him. He would break free, become a man capable of matching darkness with darkness. And he is proven valid immediately upon his liberation. Orochimaru was counting on Sasuke to be like him. And while this gamble is ultimately what abruptly ends his current path, he is correct on one aspect enough of Sasuke's persona, one enough to alter Sasuke's perception dramatically. In contrast, Naruto had many people counting on him to be unchanging. 
It seemed unlikely that they would retrieve Sasuke given the circumstances. A squad of Ginning against a group that could handily defeat Jonin. But if it's seemingly impossible odds we're talking about, who better to leave the most important task to than the man who has consistently defied expectations? Naruto is not only the closest to Sasuke out of the rescue squad, but he is also the one most likely to turn even this situation around. But their newfound unyielding faith in Naruto would be betrayed. Because Naruto could never save someone like Sasuke as he is now. Neji comments that Naruto's eyes are sometimes better than his, and the word sometimes is emphasized in this fight. Because here, Naruto's eyes are muddled even more than his rival's. Naruto wants to rescue a friend, but that want only exudes desperation, a desperate attempt to merely receive what he wants out of this conflict. The type of salvation Naruto guns for is quite a bit different than what he's pulled off before. Where he transformed a mentality in his last rescue mission, he is now only concerned with enforcing his mentality on Sasuke. And this is because he's only looking at things from his perspective, which was a powerful tool before, because he conveniently faced opponents that could empathize with his upbringing. But even when Naruto finally attempts to reach Sasuke on an emotional level, his words are dull because he is still looking at the past they shared through his own lens. The solitude Naruto experienced was quite a bit different than the one Sasuke experienced. Even his words, hearkening on power's corruption, are deafened by the dark energy he demonstrates. When he fights Sasuke, he sees his inhuman form, but he doesn't look down at the water's reflection to see his own. There's a massive hole inside him that he can't see, so how could he ever hope to fill Sasuke's? The ghastly shadow his parents left behind still lingers strongly within him. They left it up to him to conquer it. But right now, all he's doing is letting it dictate his confrontations. Naruto could not rescue Sasuke, would not, for a long time. If he wants to save a man blind to himself, then he would have to stop being blind as well. He would have to look at himself, face himself, and save himself to rescue his toughest opponent. Insight is only beneficial with a skill set to capitalize on it. Ichigo never saw himself as blessed, but neither did he see himself as burdened. The same suffering would transpire whether he could see ghosts or not. He never scorned his ability, he scorned himself. All he could ever do was the least little bit to dole lingering pain. He could never sweep it away. If it rained, he had an umbrella, but that didn't stop the crying sky, and it wouldn't protect from a storm. He learned this as a child when his powerlessness was put on full display. For a name that's supposed to mean one who protects, Ichigo could only pound on that invisible wall that keeps two worlds from colliding. He could see the carnage behind it, but he couldn't breach the other side. If fate disallowed him from intervening in the suffering right before his eyes, then he would curse it. He would curse his human weakness. But luckily for Ichigo, he was never merely human. If inherent dispositions dictate what beings can and can't do, then from birth, his potential has been boundless. It's not that he wouldn't save them. It's not that he couldn't. It's that he doesn't even know who he is. And with this lack of understanding comes untapped power. His first hint is given by a soul reaper in a seemingly unlikely event. But it isn't unlikely. This, after all, was always meant to happen given Ichigo's nature. He breaks Rukia's binding spell, which, despite her shock, is not absurd. It's what he's supposed to do, to break through boundaries in order to rescue someone. It's what Ichigo's always wanted, and always had the power to do. And finally, someone shows him how he can. Rukia, a girl that he shouldn't see, a soul reaper who shouldn't offer her abilities, is representative of the first gust of wind that sweeps the rain clouds away, blowing away Ichigo's powerlessness. And Rukia would continue to defy soul society norms despite going on about how the condemnation of mod souls are valid because laws like this offer protection, she saves Khan from the slaughterhouse after he pours his heart out. Rukia makes concessions for beliefs beyond the boundaries of law time and time again. This saves Ichigo, Orihime, Chad, Kong, and many more. But it condemns her. When the law catches up with Rukia, Ichigo is the one that confronts it, but he lacks the strength to contest it. And when the law threatens to strike him down, Rukia saves him once more. Ichigo couldn't have started on this path without her, and he would have died if not for her words. Rukia is ready to submit to authority, but Ichigo is not. Ichigo is used to defying societal standards after all. In his everyday life, he's treated harshly by authority just for having different colored hair. But he never died it. He would never change himself for someone else's dogma, even if it was the whole environment he resided in. Ichigo chooses to do the same thing again only this time in a different place on a much larger scale. 
one of his comrades that accompanies him, knows full well the disasters of dogma. Uryu's master tried to evoke change in relations between opposing factions, but was killed due to the system working as intended. The Soul Reapers arrive too late to help a desperate warrior, validating Soken's notion that Quincy cooperation is beneficial because of the response time to peril. Uryu believes he has to prove to the Soul Reapers the value in the Quincy name, but Ichigo had already looked at him enough to immediately decide on cooperation. After all, for a man who shouldn't even be a Soul Reaper, why would something like that matter to him? Through Ichigo's lack of reluctance to fight with Uryu, he gains an unlikely ally, and he would gain more unlikely allies in the Soul Society by keeping to the same ideology. Ganju opts to assist the rescue team after hearing Ichigo disregard Rukia's status in favor of what is important to him. Ikaku points Ichigo in the right direction after he patched the wounds of his fallen enemy. Rinji spills out his true desire after witnessing Ichigo's reinforced resolve. Even being hopelessly outnumbered and outmatched, he still strives forth against the current to do what he feels is right, and Rinji would later be inspired to do the same. He separated himself from Rukia after she was indoctrinated into the Kuchki family. He saw it as her finally having a real family, unlike the surrogate family they formed in Rukongai, as if the only thing that defines a family is a shared name. He was clouded by the labels of this new society. It stifled his true feelings, but it never eradicated them. He's been Squad 6's assistant captain for one purpose, but he was always too afraid to make his move. But thanks to Ichigo, not anymore. Kenpachi, for the first time, ponders a new path in his pursuit of power after witnessing Ichigo's strength with Zangetsu at his back. Ichigo had to transcend to defeat Kenpachi, because it was the first time he faced someone unbound by societal norms like himself. And this power-up gives Kenpachi interest in the foe that defeated him, which earns the rescue squad a super ally. The men Kenpachi confronts are a duo shrouded in deception. Their combined effort could not hold down a one-track resolute mind. Komamura hides his face to protect his title, as if his devotion and power wouldn't be the primary attributes observed by his peers. The fear of rejection binds him in a perpetual wavering state, and as is portrayed time and time again, in battle, mindset is the key between the victors and the losers. And Tosin? It's questionable whether he is even trying to win this fight at all. The more distractions there are, the more beneficial it is for his side. But Komamura cannot see his friend's true colors behind a cumbersome helmet. Ironically, the one out of the duo with eyes is blind. He never questioned his own justice, so why question Tosin's? The path of the Soul Reaper is surely the path of justice. I mean, look at all the good they promote. The balance of the world is dependent on their diligence. Balance for the human world, balance for the Soul Society. It is this balance that necessitates such a stark difference in class. The weak must not get in the way of the strong, otherwise they risk disturbing that equilibrium. Yet it's because of this rigid two-class system that even many of the gifted suffer, dying before they can use their powers to contribute to the system. The division between Serete and Rukongai are also what ultimately enabled the Ryoka to invade enemy territory. The assistance they received came from a part of the world that superior souls don't bother with, after all. The Soul Society's values are representative of stagnant fragility more so than anything else. So much so that all it takes is a teenager with defiance to bring about this much change and all the changes lead to this final confrontation. No personal justice takes precedence over the world's justice, Yamamoto declares. Then what is the world's justice? Ukitake replies, and Yamamoto cannot retort. Byakuya gives the same response when asked why he wouldn't save Rukia. A non-answer. He once defied steep regulations for personal interest as well. And when that decision ended in suffering, he made a hazardous declaration to never go against the grain again. It wasn't a conviction born out of the distinctions between right and wrong, but an aversion of pain. He didn't want to hurt again. He was afraid. But this absurd clinging to a disastrous promise only propagates pain. For Rukia, and for himself. He can't answer Ichigo, because his response would expose his weakness. But it doesn't matter if his weakness is on the surface or not, because during battle, a warrior's mental baggage will inevitably cause them to crumble when faced with a contestable force. He doesn't want Rukia to die. He never did. Just like Ichigo's enemy was never Byakuya, it was the law. Byakuya's enemy was never the Ryoka. It was himself. The unstoppable swell called righteous defiance triumphs against dogmatic honor. Ichigo went from human to soul reaper, and from Shikai to Bankai at record pace. This rapid progress claims victory over two captains. He looks unstoppable, but he's not.
because his true rival was lurking in the shadows of this chaos. Aizen has also been reaping rewards for carving an opposing path. He feigned allegiance, feigned his demise, and let the Ryoka believe their enemy was the Soul Society. Ichigo turned his blade on the law, but Aizen's blade was always at his throat, always at everyone's. Aizen didn't even need to confront the law. The stiff regulations themselves gave him free reign. The stagnation of authority is allowed to persist because no one bothers to contest it. No captains allowed in the council without permission? Perfect. He would become the council, and no one on top would ever know the difference. Aizen effectively became the law. He bent it to his whims, and twists this rescue journey to be not for Rukia, but for him. The Ryoka do save their friend, but the process initiates impeding doom for everyone. Rangiku can't understand why Gin is leaving without explanation again. Komamura can't understand why Tosin defects. And no one understands how Aizen makes all of them appear so fragile, even our main character. But he would understand in time. He has grown so much already, after all. Because of Ichigo, even Rukia acquires new strength. She finally faces her past and moves forward once again, but this time with many more people at her side. She rescued Ichigo from the cold rain, and Ichigo rescues her from the outdated law. Hey, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, give it a nice thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe for future content like this. I have a Patreon for those who are interested in supporting me. The closer I get to my goal, the closer we get in allowing me to focus more time on content, which means more frequent uploads. And you'll also be next to these beautiful people on screen here. Special thank you to my top supporters. Spectre Mustang, Andre Alvarado, Drepok, Johnny, and Sensei Krolon. I'm truly sorry you guys have to put up with my sparse uploads. For now, anyway. A big shout out also to Trapham. He's a friend of mine who's been making all my recent thumbnails. You're a huge help, man. Much appreciated. The link to my Discord community is in the About Me section of my Patreon page. I highly suggest everyone join, as it is the best place to converse with me on just about anything. Part 2 of my Resolution and Naruto series is coming next. I wanted a breather between parts, as I'm gunning for this video to be my best work on YouTube yet. I'm really excited to make it and will be working on it ASAP. That said, if you also want a continuation of this new Rescue Arc series, let me know in the comments. I'm not sure if spreading myself between three stories in one video was a good idea, especially since I had to reread Bleach just to write the script for this video, but hey, maybe it was worth it. You tell me. Alrighty, that's all folks. Spice Boy, out.